Hi, everyone. Um, all right. So um, thank you so much um, for joining us on this, uh, for this discussion of empathy and game design. Um, you know, I think empathy is a word that um, gets thrown around a lot, especially when it comes to game design and gameplay. Um, and its basic definition is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Um, however, in many contexts and um, in the context of this discussion, um, I'd like to broaden the topic to not only empathy, but also um, compassion. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe during the discussion, we'll talk a little bit more about the nuances between the two. But I think largely what we'll be discussing is the powerful um, capability games have to put players in the shoes of another and the game design responsibilities, um, requirements, and implications that come with that power. Um, and, you know, we, we cannot have we could not have a more amazing panel uh, lined up to tackle this really complex and nuanced and important topic. So um, with that, we have Brenda Romero, Hector Fuster, and Ken Hall here today to talk about this. And I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, and then from there, we're gonna go ahead and talk about game design for empathy for about 45 minutes. And then we're going to open up the discussion to Q and A. Um, okay, so let's kick things off with some intros. I'm going to ask everyone to introduce themselves um, and share just a teaser of what their relationship uh, with game design and empathy is. Um, so let's start with Brenda and then go to Hector and then Ken. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Brenda Romero. Um, just a teaser. I guess at the highest level, uh, I'm always thinking of what the player will be thinking or feeling, um, no matter what type of game I'm making. Uh, so I, I guess that's, that's on the very highest level. But when, for me, it comes down to how do I get the player into the game and how can I get them to feel what I want them to feel? And how can I get them to form some kind of attachment to these, to the theme of the game or the other characters in the game, or even, I guess, if it's a multiplayer game, the other people in the game. Um, so that's just on a, a very high level for me. Hey, hi, everyone. I'm Hector Fuster. So myself as a teaser, uh, I would say my, my formation is in psychology. I'm a clinical psychologist uh, by, by default. And then I joined the ranks of game designers. Uh, and I think as a, a thing that I have just embedded in myself just by my formation is uh, thinking always about the position the player finds itself uh, uh, in and, and how motivation, uh, the expectation that you have for a given situation in, in gameplay uh, may affect the player. And, and in the end, how we can use that to even create a different expectation and maybe a change in the player mind. And I would leave it at that for the moment. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Ken Hall and the creative director of uh, Two Dogs Games. Um, and we're working on a game called uh, Destiny Sword. And, and really for me, I've been working, you know, for the, the majority of my career now actually uh, on sort of games as a service product. So for me, it's always about, uh, you know, trying to find that way that we can create that emotional attachment between the, the, the player and the, the content, you know, whether that's the, the, the characters, you know, either the protagonist or the antagonist, you know, how we create that sense of personal investment and attachment. Um, and, and really, you know, uh, what I find is, is that the more opportunity there is for empathy, you know, in that, the, 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 the greater the sense of connection we can, we can create. And, and ideally we want to take that beyond the game and actually, you know, take that into the community as well, give players an opportunity to, to really form, uh, you know, and, and develop their empathy, you know, for each other as well as, as for the content in the game. So that's kind of the, the objective that we've been working towards for the last while. That's awesome. Uh, thank you, Brenda, Hector, and Ken. That's, that's, um, uh, we're going to have a really great discussion. Uh, uh, about all of these things. And I know some of you already alluded to this a little bit, um, but let's start with talking about um, what do you think empathy's place in game design is? And I know this is a big, broad topic. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll take, take it and run it with it. Sure, I can, I can I, oh, go, go for it, Hector, you go ahead. <laughs> I can, I can <laughs> uh, I think I think it's impossible to, to design games without taking into account empathy. Uh, but at the same time, there is different levels of empathy. 
So it's not possible to create a, a, a good experience without taking into account what is the position of the player at each time. But at the same time, I think uh, more and more designers have a responsibility of, of making good use of that power. Uh, and we have seen that in, in some games as a service and maybe some uh, business models, we use empathy or cognitive empathy alone uh, as a way to, to modify player behavior in certain ways. So designers are quite empathetic with the players. But uh, at the same time, we need to strive or we need to find more ways that we can design so to make the players also empathetic. So it's not only a, a, a one directional route. Yeah, and I think, you know, empathy is one of those things where it's kind of, you know, sneaky. I think in some ways we've been kind of skirting around the, the edge of it since the very beginning of games. Uh, you know, even things like, you, you know, look at, look at Donkey Kong and having to read kind of the, the visual and the emotional cues of this, uh, this antagonist and try to decide what his actions are going to be based on that. And, and, you know, so that, that whole kind of concept of, you know, trying to read the feedback and, and react to it and, and try to then modify, you know, the, the state. I mean, it, a lot of times it's been presented in a very abstract form that, uh, that really has no relation to the real world. But that, that's something we're seeing as we make games that are more realistic and become more, uh, you know, kind of immersive. Um, you know, that, that line between, you know, the abstract and, and the real is, is blurring a lot. And so we're, we're finding a lot of games that are, are really trying to, to elicit specific emotions from the players, but also to, to really convey certain things. And I, I think that's one of those double-edged swords, right? You know, we're seeing, you know, whether it's a, a combat game and, and they're actually trying to make the player feel the, 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 the fear and things like that, or a horror game, you know, feel the fear of the, uh, of the main character. And, and, you know, that has a whole bunch of ramifications, you know, secondary uh, you know, trauma implications and stuff like that, that obviously you have to be very careful with. So, you know, as the tools become more powerful, I think, you know, we as developers have to be more, you know, cognizant of, of what we're doing and, and, you know, the effect that it can, can have on people. Um, there, there, obviously, empathy is something that's, you know, extremely, uh, you know, valuable tool and something we really want players to develop, but used in the wrong way, it can be quite, quite destructive as well. Yeah, I, so just in, in terms of one of the things, and this is what I'm about to say, it will be a surprise to, to nobody, um, is if we want players to feel something, we have to make players feel like they are first and foremost welcomed in the game. So um, if I'm going into a game and my only choice is to play people who don't look like me, uh, or, or, you know, like it wasn't, I was in the game industry for seven years before I could play as a female in a video game. So I can end up losing, uh, I, I, can, I can end up being knocked out of the game or not necessarily able to form an attachment if, I don't, if, if nothing in the game mirrors who I am or what I think or what my experience may be. So I think first and foremost, just on the, the, the most bare bones level of design, the player first must be able to form that attachment to something in the game and not be repelled from it by, you know, a story you can't, this is not a story you can get into or, um, or you can't create a character who looks like you in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, there's, there's loads of stories uh, that I have there that I remember, um, well, I, there's loads of stories and I won't turn it into a speaker thing, but I, <laughs> I figure it's just important, first of all, that our players can connect. If we are putting up obvious walls for players so that they can't even connect, it's going to be very difficult for them to have any kind of empathetic reaction to anything. Yeah, those are all, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a frog in my throat this morning. Those are all really, really um, good points. And, and so my, my next question was going to ask if, um, if you think all games require empathy. Um, and uh, I think to kind of build on um, kind of what a, a lot of you were talking about, um, can games not have an empathetic component in the game design is can it like do they require it or can you even have a game that doesn't have it if that makes sense i think you don't have to have empathy in a game i mean i play there's a, a just a casual game called drop seven that i play every night there's zero empathy there um i i'm i'm maybe married to somebody who plays does a lot of first person shooters and plays a lot of deathmatch. I don't see any empathy happening there. Um, I don't think it's necessary, but for certain types of games, I do think it 
absolutely is a core component of the design. This, there is another problem that uh, empathy comes with steam and with steam comes characterization. So you may only want to, to do, tackle a certain subject, but without any, any intention. And you may create empathy and some emotions and some situations without even knowing that you are creating that. And at the same time, there are some games, for example, when we work uh, with Gris, uh, there was this, this situation in which uh, we knew that uh, the, the game was not verbal, it was only symbolism and, and an image. Uh, and we knew that that would have a strong effect on the player because the player can project himself or herself into that uh, imaginary. And, and we need to tread carefully because uh, projections are managed by the player, not by the designer. And, and those are interesting things that may happen. Uh, and if you don't realize that this has happened, uh, you may have a different result that you, you were expecting. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I guess, um, so this wasn't gonna be my next question, but I kind of want to dive into that a little bit further. Um, it, it seems like in many cases, empathy is, is kind of in the eye of the beholder, right? Like what, you know, what you as a developer, as a designer brings to the experience might be totally different than what the player brings to a gameplay experience. And so how do you go about sort of reconciling that and kind of keeping that uh, in mind as you're designing an experience using you know, your own experiences as a, as a designer, knowing that not everyone is going to share your brain. Uh, I, can, I can start with that. I, I, what I do, so I didn't mention at the beginning, I'm working on a game um, very close to launch, in fact, uh, called Empire Sin. So Empire Sin, um, one of the things that we do early on is we first and foremost try to have a pretty diverse development team. Um, because that is one of the safeguards of, of sending something out into the world unchecked. Uh, when, one of the ways to safeguard against that. And then we also, you know, we're fortunate that our, our publisher, Paradox, is fantastic with giving us all the UR that we want. So we also, um, we, we, throw that, we throw the game out there so early. Like I know that 90% of, 95%, who knows, of what I'm going to get back is, oh, it's missing all these things, it's barely running. It is, in fact, because we, we go out for UR really early. But I would rather catch something right in the bud, or if somebody somebody on, say, the, um, the players, if one of the players says, I really like this thing and I hope they, those things can be worth their weight in gold, you know? So, um, you know, I, I, but I, those are just a couple of the things that, that, that I take into account when I'm, when I'm designing, and sometimes Sometimes I have actually, you know, there's like, there's in-game empathy and then there's a, a, like game empathy that's intrinsic to the game. And then sometimes there's, um, sometimes there's, I don't know how to describe this, but anti-empathy. So I have a, one of the board games, well, board games that I've made, it's a, it's a 50,000 piece game. Um, and I've been asked if I would consider having you know, the pieces being able to move them by thousands or by five thousands, because that would be the kind thing to do. But because the game is about a horrible moment in human history, I've decided that if you want to play, you are going to move every one of those, those pieces. And that is, a, that is a deliberate decision on my part so that people can see just the scale of, of the atrocity that happened. Um, it's about the, the Trail of Tears. Um, so I guess that's, that's kind of backwards, um, but those are deliberate decisions that I'm taking into account, which I, uh, because I want the player to feel something and that's what, I, that's what I need to do. And then on the flip side, going out early for UR um, and having a diverse development team, uh, those type of things are incredibly useful and worth, worth their weight in gold. I, I can't agree enough with uh, Brenda there that, you know, it, it, a lot of it is about the community. Obviously, it, you know, as, as you say, it, it, perspective is so individual that you really need to, to get as much exposure as possible. Um, you know, for instance, for us as, as an indie, we don't have a publisher who's able to, to give us access to that, uh, that community to do those reviews. So we're lucky enough that, that nowadays there's, there's so many great shows, you know, whether it's the, the, the PAX events or, or things like that, where we're able to, to get our, our game, again, very, very early into the, the hands of, of players and, and watch the reactions and, and, you know, gauge their feedback, but also actually get to, to chat with them one-to-one -one about it. To, 
and, you know, find out what is it, you know, making them think or feel and what are some of the, the positive and negative aspects that, that they're encountering in their experience. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, you really get a, an insight there that you just can't. And I, I echo the same sentiment, you know, we went off extremely early and you, you get that, uh, you know, sort of those, those split responses. Some people who can see the vision of it and go, wow, this is going to be amazing. And, and others who go, oh, this is, you know, more holes in a piece of Swiss cheese. And it's like, well, of course it is, you know, it, uh, you know, we're, we're super early and we're a very small group, but, uh, but yeah, and, I mean, obviously, and, and diversity of opinion is, is so important because, you know, especially nowadays where we're, you know, with, with you know, uh, portals like Steam and stuff, we have access to a global marketplace, you know, it's so important to, to not just be thinking about it from our own, uh, you know, experiential viewpoint, but to, to really sort of get an idea for how people, you know, all around the world from different cultures, uh, in different genders, how everybody, the, the more inclusive we can make that uh, review process, the, the better information we're going to get. So yeah, that's a, that's a huge part of how we go about it. Um, obviously, you know, we, we try and, uh, you know, build off our own experience, first of all, and, and the broader that is, the better starting point we can have. But, but then, yeah, you have to get, uh, get feedback from other people on it. And sometimes that's a painful process, but it's, it's essential. That is also the, the, uh, a related problem that maybe uh, you are designing that game uh, with that empathetic experience in your mind, but in the end doesn't work for the, for the people that plays it. And, and you end up doing something like it's like uh, empathy tourism. So you, the player is there, but doesn't uh, give any more thought than, than just passing by. And that may be harmful, harmful at, at a community level, but harmful at a player level, because you are desensitizing, desensitizing them to, to that experience. So there is quite a responsibility if you're trying to achieve empathy in your game. And, and that is why it's so important to, to be sure that the experience is going to be uh, properly understood or at least at some level for the for any given player. Do you, do you find that empathy is, um, for the most part, something, uh, or the empathy that you're trying to create in your game, something that's one size fits all? I mean, that's very broad, obviously, but, but or, or do, you, do you find yourself in, in cases where some groups of people really connect and, and kind of develop this sense of empathy through the game experience and other people it just doesn't really connect with a little bit like what you were saying Hector um and is that okay or does that mean that there's you have to deep, dig a little further is the goal to try to get the majority of players to feel this or are you okay with just a few people really feeling it if that makes sense I, I think yeah, so much of it depends happened. oh sorry, go ahead Hector you go ahead <laughs> so, that's something that it, it, no it's interesting because it's something that happened with Greece Greece doesn't have any verbal message so it, and it, everything needs to be interpreted. And a lot of people did not get the, 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 the narrative that we were striving for, but it doesn't matter. Uh, because at some level, uh, people projected themselves and, and understood whatever they needed at that moment. As long as that is, is in place, I think that is enough. And some people will get everything, and there's a lot of symbolism in that game. And some people just would get a, a, a good experience, they felt something that maybe cannot even put in, in words what they felt, but they had a good experience and it's enough to start uh, the conversation. And I think that the type of product makes such a difference to that too, because there's lots of games that are, are very sort of linear uh, experiences. And obviously, you know, you are trying to, to elicit a, a very similar response from everybody. Um, you know, and then, you know, in our case, you know, we, we've got this sort of persistent, uh, you know, world environment. So we're, we're trying to give players more of a, you know, room to, to explore and, and, you know, discover themselves, uh, you know, discover who they are in the game world, you know, in a, in a safe and inclusive uh, sense and, and, and really get a chance to, to sort of try on different hats uh, as they're going through it. So, so in that case, there is no real one size fits all. You're just trying to create systems that allow players to express themselves and explore themselves and, uh, and communicate with each other and try to, to sort of form those bonds and they may evolve and shift over time as well. It may not, the experience they have, you know, the first time they play the game may be radically different with a different community set or, a, you know, just because they want to try something different by, you know, acting or, you know, engaging with the game in a different fashion too. So it can be a very evolving dynamic process. I think too, there's, you know, it, 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 and it's so different game to game. Like I have a, 
I have a board game called Train, which is about really difficult subject matter. And somebody wanted to, this group of um, students wanted to play the game as just a, we, we can't wait to play this, we're going to trash it all. And, and so I refused to let them play it, um, which it's a one of a kind board game. So I was there and, and, and I can do that, but I don't know how many other games that would apply to. Um, and then I've had, you know, sometimes um, the experience is the, an experience a player has is so dependent upon the player themselves, which we can't possibly account for. Um, you know, I, I remember, um, I remember playing What Remains of Edith Finch and realizing the character was pregnant. For some reason, I looked down at the very beginning. Um, and I was just so like, I was thrilled that I was playing a pregnant woman in a game. I was like, my God, this isn't, why is, you know, I just thought that was fantastic. Um, but that experience might be unique to me. And then I also wrote in this quest uh, in Wizardry 8, this is a game in the early 2000s, where if you played Wizardry 6, which is from the 80s, and you took an item from there into Wizardry 7, which is in the 90s, and you somehow brought in that save game into Wizardry 8 in 2001, you still have that item. I wrote a special quest just for you. Now, maybe it was one player who hit that. Um, and that I felt completely okay with that. Now I'm sure a producer wouldn't have if there had been lots of graphics and you know, other stuff, but it was just pure text. But um, I guess it's, it's a question of how special does that feel? It's also so dependent on time. You know, for people to form bonds requires that, you know, requires a, a depth of time in, in the game often. That's, uh, that's really cool about the quest. Um, I love that. Um, so I, I, we've been kind of talking about this already, um, but uh, you know, I feel like there's, there's, there's two ways of looking at um, empathy in game design, right? There's one from the developer to character perspective in terms of understanding the feelings of the character, um, like as you're designing it and kind of bringing your experiences to, to it. And then the other is from game to player in terms of um, evoking a feeling and empathy via the characters and the moments in the game, which we've been talking a lot about. Um, and so uh, again, this is, you've each alluded to it a little bit, but I'd like to dive a little bit more deeply into what techniques um, you've used to evoke this sense of empathy um, and, and compassion in your work. Um, and, and what have you found to be successful and um, have there been things that you found to be unsuccessful um, as you've been you know, exploring this in each of your work um, throughout the years? For, for us, it's really about, uh, you know, trying to go beyond the narrative. Uh, you know, it, it's really about, you know, looking at things like, you know, the body language of the characters, you know, very little visual details, you know, do they have bags under their eyes because they haven't been sleeping, maybe that sort of thing. Um, you know, and, and using, you know, uh, we've got a lucky to have a fantastic audio designer too, and, and using the soundscape to sort of craft that. And, and, and really, we find that, you know, when we actually communicate, so much of that is nonverbal. Um, that, that picking up on those those cues really helped to make it much more relatable and much more uh, of a kind of a stronger emotional engagement in that communication process. So for us, that's one of the things that we're finding is is really making a big difference uh, in terms of the the amount of engagement and empathy we're able to generate. Uh, sure. Okay, I'll go ahead. I think. Um... For me, I'm, I'm, it's about player investment and how much time they put into something. Um, so you know, the, the longer they've built something, the more they've had maybe, you know, so like in the case of Empire of Sin, they might have one of the characters with them for a long period of time, they've invested in that character, they've improved that character, that character has changed um, based on their actions. The character may have even fallen in love um, with another character that they had. So some kind of investment in a character plus time, I often find works really, really well. Um, things that I don't find work so well, I, there was one game that will, will remain nameless and I remember it was like, this sheep, if you, don't, if you don't, I don't know, pay something, buy something, do something to the sheep, the sheep is gonna die. And I remember that came up in a casual game and I was, I guess maybe the designer in me didn't fall for it. It was just so quickly, it's like, you don't care about the sheep, you care about the money. And I remember just thinking like, you might as well just put, and even the button I think said, let it die or something. It was horrible and I was just like, you know what? Yeah, let it die. If that's the predicament you're gonna put me in. And it was just, it was such a, 
it was just such an obvious money pull, such an obvious cheap attempt to make me feel some kind of, oh no, you know, it was, it was just a ploy. And I think any intelligent gamer would just see straight through that and maybe not click the let it die button, maybe look away, but just, you know, probably just be turned off the game entirely. But I you used to see a, a fair amount of those in, in casual games, um, probably 10 years ago now. And, and as Brenda said, you, you need patience and, and, and you need to be respectful with the player. You cannot bludgeon in your, your message in there because the player is not an idiot and, 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 and won't understand that you treated him or her like that. So the idea is, is giving those breadcrumbs uh, through th this information that will help the, the, the player gain that insight about that character that, or that team that you have uh, in, your game, in your game. And if the player feels that is interesting, uh, he or she will stay until, until the end. Uh, one cool thing that happens with games is uh, they lower our psychological defenses. So I, for example, use a lot of games in my clinical practice because it's a good way to start the, to start the conversation about topics that one does not want to talk about. But since it's not me, it's the avatar that it's, that it's suffering that, it's easy to talk about that. And in those moments, uh, the player might gain self-compassion, which is the, the, the end step of empathy. It's, it's being able to project oneself in the, in the other and then understand that I have lived through something similar, maybe, and maybe I can be compassionate about myself. And that needs patience. There is no other way to achieve that. And alongside patience, you need to, to show vulnerability. As a designer, because in the end, those are artistic creations and you are putting yourself in the game. That is like that. There is no other way around it. And vulnerability for the characters. Uh, and that is something that I think as an industry we are striving right now. We, we, I think we overcome the illusion of empowerment and we are now exploring other themes that are, I think, at the community level, more interesting. That's great. Yeah, it, you know, it, it makes me wonder, you know, empathy in, in media is certainly nothing new, you know, in books and movies and TV shows, you know, there's that, that connection, certainly. Um, but it does seem like games have sort of the special power, right? Because there's that sense of agency and that, spend, that, that sense of, of time investment, you know, often people will spend far more hours with the game than they would with a film. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, I think there, there, there is something that's especially compelling about, about interacting with users in that, in that way. Um, I know, Ken, you, you met, uh, alluded to earlier, though, that there's sort of a you know, responsibility that comes with that too, because, because you can have this, this powerful impact and this connection that you can make with, with people and, and, and you know, powerful emotional experience that, that games can create. There's also a um, potential to have this be a negative thing, perhaps. Um, and, and so I, I'd be curious to, to get everyone's thoughts um, on that. Uh, well, I guess I'll start with Ken since you brought it up initially. You opened up that can of worms. <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it I, you know, I think Brenda's example is a, a good one, you know, with the, the sheep and the, the let mm -hmm. it die. But I mean, you know, we think of empathy as being a positive thing because, you know, that's, that's typically what we associate it with, but it's really a, just a neutral process of, of you know, uh, understanding and reacting uh, to emotion and then trying to, um, uh, you know, to, to react to that. And, and, you know, it, it's, you know, sort of some of the darker sides, you know, like, look at advertising where they, they try to use our emotions against us to manipulate us into certain courses of action or in the case of, you know, threat generation, like Brenda is saying, you know, I mean, th there's some, some really strong examples. I mean, I had my own example, you know, when I was researching, you know, back when we started our, you know, project, you know, researching a lot of these sort of uh, narrative games and, you know, a lot of the story ones and they're, you know, be popular at high school kind of stories and, you know, you go through and then you start getting, you know, sexually harassed by, you know, some bully at school or something. And you actually have to pay to deal with this harasser. If you don't pay to deal with this harasser, then you have to just sit there and accept it. And it's like, whoa, and this is for teens, you know, and you're thinking, so there, there are some, some extremely, you know, um, jarring examples of things where, you know, if we get people feeling that strongly, um, obviously we can, we can sort of do terrible things with those feelings in terms of either manipulation or, or accidental, 
causing accidental damage. But, um, you know, the other one I was talking about is that a lot of these war games are getting so realistic that they want you to feel what it's like to be a soldier. Well, we know what happens to soldiers where that's, you know, one of the things we're trying to explore in our game is, is the long-term consequences of, of conflict. And, you know, we're, we're talking to lots of veterans, uh, you know, about their experiences. And I, I've done that throughout my career as well. Um, and, and, you know, they to a person say, you don't want to experience this. That's, that's the whole point of what we're trying to say is, is how terrible this is. So why would anybody voluntarily want to expose themselves to that? And, you know, as we start to learn more and more about even that the, the therapists were dealing with some of the traumas that first responders and veterans and stuff are, are seeing, you know, secondhand trauma is a, is a real thing. And so, you know, again, we have to be really careful about, you know, how we subject people to these experiences and, and then how we kind of guide them through them, you know, so as not to cause lasting damage for sure. Yeah, boy, that's a, that is a, that's a challenging topic. All right. Um, I don't know that I could add anything uh, more to that than, than what Ken said. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tricky topic. There is the, that author that I like a lot, that's Peter Singer, that has uh, this theory of the expanding circle, and he talks about the, the cycle of empathy. It grows mm -hmm. from the individual to the family to the group to the community. Uh, and the cool idea about this is, in the end, empathy establishes itself as, as morals. So there is the emotional experience, but in the end, everything gets rationalized at some point. Mm -hmm. And we need to keep in mind that every experience that we give to the player is going to be rationalized in a life experience that may be impactful or not, but if it's impactful, it will change the player. And if it impacts enough players, it will change the moral status of, of society. And, and we have ex a lot of examples of that in, in, in history, in novels, movies, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that is a responsibility. That is a double-edged sword. And, and the problem is that, uh, as with any digital media, uh, it viralizes super quick, and we don't know the real impact of a product until it reaches the market. And that's something that is food for thought. We need to keep it in mind. And yeah, it's yeah, it's it's an interesting topic. I you know, one of the things. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I? Please, add no, no, no. Please go ahead. Please. Um, one of the things, just this discussion, I, you know, I, I, for some reason, I keep thinking about out the outside of the game and just games as cultural objects by themselves. Um, I've been, so I, I'm, uh, my husband uh, was one of the creators of Doom and we, we, you know, we'll travel a fair number of places and, you know, he'll speak at conferences. And one of the things I've seen are people coming up with with tears in their eyes, describing the experience that they had, often with their father, um, uh, or or you know, a parent, their mother, their brother, or something, uh, and just how much that experience and how much games are a part are, you know, how they are more than just the game at this point in time, and that we are creating these these cultural artifacts that people will be attached to and that that can go on to create things far beyond what we ever thought that they could could do. Um, just some of the things we were talking about there uh, made me think about that. And, and just off the back of that, I'd love to just put in a quick plug for one of my good friends, Scott Jones' podcast, Heavily Pixelated, where he actually talks to you know uh, players about how games change their lives, how they, in some mm -hmm. cases, save their lives from from personal experiences. And what's really cool about it is he connects them to the developer of that actual game and lets them thank that developer for the experience. But uh, oh, what a great so, idea! I mean, it's just it's just neat to see you know how how they move different people in different ways and different situations. It really gives us a sense of, you know, what we're playing for here. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that, you know, as game designers, game developers, we wield a lot of power. Um, and what, I guess, how would you recommend, if you recommend, game designers to educate themselves so that they are making responsible decisions, you know, because I think in some cases, people just don't realize, you know, the impact that their products can make, um, good or bad, you know, um, uh, 
But I think especially maybe the, the potential unintended negative consequences may not be something that's taken into consideration. Um, and, and just, you know, how deeply their product can touch people maybe isn't fully realized in, in some cases, especially for games that aren't maybe necessarily developed with empathy and huge emotional arcs like in mind, but nonetheless will create these moments with people um, as a cultural artifact and, um, and just resonate in some way. Um, and, and so, yeah, I guess what would be, what were your thoughts on that? And, and would you have any advice or recommendation for developers and designers uh, in terms of how to educate themselves and, and, and think about this? Man, that's, that's yet another tricky question because I'm, I, I'm gonna give two answers out of, out of a, nearly a split head. Um, on the one answer is don't listen to what people say. Do what you deeply believe in. If you believe that what you're doing is the right thing and you think that you are create and you are being true to the game. The, um, the first person who knew about train, uh, told me that I shouldn't make it. Um, and then the second person who knew about train told me that games had to be fun and that, that I shouldn't do it. And, and I, you know, I've, I've still got, you know, hopefully a few games in me. Um, but, but I think that'll at the end of the day, you know, be the game that I'm most proud of because it was the most challenging to make. Um, and certainly nobody in 1993 thought Doom was a good idea. Uh, but yet it is, um, you know, it is, it is lasted, you know, it's, it's lasted for, uh, uh, well, it's still going, right? Um, but I do think that there are, if you are going to create something that you as an artist are responsible for what you put out into the world, I do think that things that are, that w w things that we are not, um, it, things that are put out there, say, to deliberately offend or um, to deliberately provoke, like you own that. Um, and I'm not saying that, that those stories aren't possible. I mean, certainly if you look at books and movies and film, um, they don't have those same constraints, like has to be fun or whatever, right? Um, I, I just think, uh, I, I don't know that there's any training. I think that the best, you know, sometimes you just deeply feel it. I, in, in you make you make what it is you feel, and you just try to do justice to it. Um, I don't know that I would set out to make a game that was deliberately going to offend people. Um, it's so individual to the topic, so individual to the designer. But if I had listened to people, I wouldn't have made the games that I'm most proud of. Yeah, I think that uh, you know if you're if you're asking how do you. Uh, you know, develop your ability to to understand the impact of the game on on people. It's it, you're you're basically asking how do you train up your own uh, empathy? You know, and it, uh, you know, I think really it's it's you know, first of all, it starts with diversity. You know, understanding a, a diverse group of uh, of individuals. You know, and understanding their experiences. Um, for me, you know, my, my background, it, it really started to develop in me when I started interviewing veterans for, I, I did a, a historical flight simulator called B-17. Um, and, you know, we had to interview veterans and it really, that took me out of my own personal safe space and, and into these other people's worlds that, that existed, you know, half a century ago, but also half a world away. And it, it really started to uh, you know, make me explore, okay, why do I think what I think, you know, why do I feel what I feel and how would I, how would those be different in a, a different place and time and that sort of thing. And then of course, you know, my, my development career had me, you know, uh, halfway around the world for, for large chunks of my, my life as well. So, you know, I got a, a firsthand opportunity to live in a different environment and, you know, uh, explore that. So I, I think, you know, just range of experience, range of, uh, you know, sort of exposure is, is a huge part of it, but also, you know, like we said, you know, some, some of the podcasts like heavily pixelated, but there's lots of good books out there too about how games do affect people and understanding, you know, both the positive and negative things, you know, that way. Um, but I, I also think, you know, like Brenda says, I, I don't think you can set out to try to, you know, I, I don't think we necessarily should set out to try to, to make a game that it has a particular impact you know, in, in certain situations, I think, I think generally it's about, you know, creating first and foremost, uh, an experience that, that is true to, to what we're designing. And, and then, you know, being aware of, of the, 
the potential pitfalls and and benefits is great but i think if you if you try to sort of head for anything like that it, it very quickly becomes disingenuous you know it, it becomes obvious that you're you're going for that that you know you know either positive or negative you know and 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 it it doesn't really kind of resonate so i think you know you have to be aware of these things but you also have to kind of then put that to the the back and and, and almost designed by um you know kind of instinct really just just you know you use your gut to to sort of lead you down the road and then obviously during the review process you get a chance to to kind of evaluate that but i don't think you can yeah i think it's better if you start out you know designing with your heart rather than your mind i think is probably the easiest way to, to put it yeah i think uh, as, as ken pointed out uh, life experience is one of the most important resources that you have as a, as a designer and if you want to communicate something about an experience uh, about empathy life experience is what uh, you will rely on to, to communicate that in the end you are creating a fiction and that fiction that illusion it's to be believable enough so the player embeds it himself in, in it and that's not easy to do and, and you're, you're not going to have a book that tells you how to do that it depends on the theme it depends on the characters and a lot of things and at the same time uh, we, we video game creators uh, are creating cultural artifacts that are the total art they, they include everything and not only that they include interaction and if you don't know enough about the theme you're trying to compel to the player uh, you are not going to create uh, the correct mechanics that uh, generates those emotions so it comes to mind for example in Hellblade they use that claim that if you die enough times, you simply will lose the game. Save game deleted and everything. And it was a lie. But at that point, that serves to compel paranoia. And that paranoia was the empathy, empathetic moment. So understanding that and then just work with that to create the, the right choice, the right mechanic, the right message, uh, it, it comes not from a study, but from, from embedding oneself in the research and just trying to leave that. Yeah, that was a great phrase, Hector. Um, I mean, if you don't feel it as a designer, your players aren't going to feel it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's gospel. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of uh, nuggets of wisdom in, in everyone's answers. So thank you for, for all of those. Um, so we're just past the 1045 mark. So um, I promised that we'd open it up to Q&A. So if anyone has any questions um, that you'd like to share, with our amazing panelists here, please uh, let me know. Um, I'll keep an eye out in the Zoom chat or Q&A um, or Slack. Um, I don't see any right now. Um, so um, I guess uh, while we're waiting for any questions to come in, um, I have a few questions I can ask. Um, also, I wanted to open this up too, if any of the panelists have anything in particular that they wanna share or touch upon or discuss more, um, uh, please, uh, by all means, um, jump in. Otherwise, I'll just keep throwing my, my many questions at you, which I'm happy to do too. All right, um, I will take that as a sign for more questions. So, um, you know, I, I've, uh, I've had conversations before where people are very nuanced about the terms empathy versus compassion versus sympathy. Um, I know we've been talking about everything very broadly um, right now, but um, I was curious if, if any of you had any thoughts about sort of the difference between the three and, and why that might be important, or maybe it isn't important um, in how you approach um, game design. Well, when I'm working on the games uh, about difficult subject matter, which in, you know, are about tragedies that have, uh, that have happened, um, empathy is absolutely critical. I mean, you know, it just, I, I can't even imagine doing it without first spending a lot of time trying to put myself in, in this space um, and doing a lot of research. So, so for train, the research was somewhere between nine months and a year. And that's all I was doing before I built the game. Um, and other topics, you know, have, have, have had that same amount of time. But if you don't, if you can't really understand it, I feel like you're just doing a tremendous disservice to it. Um, uh, in, in, for me, sp speaking more specifically with Train, there was a, a picture, I was trying to figure out how I could get myself, how I could most closely identify. So there was a picture of two young boys that I spent time with every day. Um, 
and trying to think like if those were my kids what would i do trying to put myself my me as a mother in the shoes of a mother who would have gone through this event um and it allowed me to connect it allowed me to feel empathy with her it allowed me to try in some way shape or form to feel even just you know, a molecule of of what somebody at that time would have felt but it was critical if i hadn't have done that i couldn't have made the game now granted it's pretty heavy subject matter that's great um so we do have a question um so um i'm going to jump into that and then we can go back to this too if we want to continue this discussion um so uh, the question is, do you think that games that employ empathy can teach players empathy, or is it more of an element of engagement versus game design? We, we hope so. <laughs> That's one of the things that we're, we're trying to do. And, and, you know, I don't know as much as, as teach empathy. You know, we can certainly try to, uh, you know, demonstrate the, the, the skills. I mean, in our game, you know, we're, we're trying to, as I say, use some of these nonverbal cues and get the player to recognize those and, and identify you know, when their characters are, are you know, struggling and need to, to be sort of helped in a certain direction, um, you know, whether that, that, that's things like, you know, seeing bags under the eyes if they're not sleeping or seeing, a, you know, a bruise on the cheek if there's been a bit of a, a scuffle in the, uh, in the team. But, um, but yeah, I think the other thing is just encouraging the formation of empathy, you know, designing mechanics that reward players for recognizing these things and, and, and reward them for, you know, acting empathically with other players and, and you know, recognizing when, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, situations where they can, um, you know, support each other and, and make a difference both in the exper game experience, but also in the, in the, just the, the, you know, community aspect, you know, in, in the broader sense. Um, so anytime we can, we can, you know, uh, create elements that, that reward and, and create that positive feedback loop, we're going to, you know, see a development uh, process there. So, yeah, I mean, we certainly hope that we can, we can improve the empathy. I mean, I, I, again, I think people are naturally more predisposed uh, based on their personality types. Um, but yeah, hopefully we can, we can actually create that, you know, positive development. And there is uh, that other oh, that other thing that no problem. Uh, there is another thing that uh, any any game is a simulation, and any simulation it's it's uh, an exercise in learning that simulation. So any game is is a learning experience in that sense. And at the same time, that learning may be good or maybe bad. So uh, for example, games that use uh, moral systems or games that put you in difficult positions, but there is always an economy system attached to that decision. So for example, it comes to mind this one of mine, which is an amazing game, but in the end, there was that economic uh, attrition constantly and, and it difficulted all your decisions because you were thinking with your uh, brain in an emotional sense, but at, at the end, you want to win the game and just, just rationalize. So I don't know uh, if those teachings are good or bad. The, the idea that I have in mind, I think it's something that it's uh, quite easy to wrap your mind around is that uh, you may teach empathy in the sense that exposure to empathetic uh, situations uh, will teach empathy, more or less, depending on the, on the user. Uh, but you can degrade empathy. You can desensitize, desensitize around empathy. So we need to be mindful on how the systems uh, may tackle that uh, experience for that user. One of the most powerful moments of empathy that I have ever, ever had in a game I'm positive the designer, well, I shouldn't say that. I would be surprised if the designer intended it to have the outcome that it had. So it was in one of my favorite games of all time, Civilization Revolution, and I was playing Gandhi because I like playing Gandhi. And I had built up quite a war machine. And as Gandhi, I sent an ICBM uh, into, I believe, the Japanese. And I'll tell you how I remember it in my head. I remember that the screen goes gray when I launch the nuke and then it shakes and then this it, this rocket or the ICBM goes up and it takes forever. I mean, it felt like a 30 second gameplay sequence, but in that time I was realizing, I was like, oh my God, like I am, it gave me, like I built this huge empire and then I decided oh, there are other win conditions. But I remember just feeling like I just nuked somebody as Gandhi. And it, 
that has such a last, it's still like, I still, when I think about really impactful game moments, um, that one will always stick with me. And I will, and you know, from that time, I, when I'm playing Gandhi, I will always attempt not to go for that super takeout option. Um, you know, but again, it was, there was just something about the way that it was delivered, the time that it took for that action to occur. So I could really think about what, if it had happened like that, um, it would have been a much different, it would have been a much different outcome, but it didn't, you know, it was that extra time that uh, Sid Meier in this case uh, uh, gave it that really just stuck with me for the longest time. Or, you know, I've seen like, you know, being, um, being a mom, I've seen kids, you know, who've lost their characters uh, or, be, or, or being really concerned that if they, they aren't keeping their subscriptions up, that their, you know, their wow characters are going to be trashed or something like that because they're so, or actually there's even more, sorry, I'm, I'm getting into a TED Talk level thing here. The craziest one, I still think about this, I had a disc, five and a quarter inch disc from 1981 um, that had my original wizardry party on it. And I decided I didn't need that disc anymore and I got rid of it and I still regret that decision. I'm sure the disc isn't even readable and they're not even real characters, but I still feel sad that I get rid of it because they meant a lot to me. It's amazing. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I feel like all of us can relate to that in, you know, some case, you know, because you spend so much time, you know, with the games and the characters and you build these relationships and it is like, almost like real friendships in a way. Um, wonderful. All right. Um, so we have uh, just under five minutes. So um, does anyone have any closing thoughts, words of wisdom? Um, Anything you want to share before we um, move on to the next panel? I think in the end, empathy is a tricky thing. Um, I think what one player can feel very strongly about, other players may entirely miss. And as designers, we have to be aware of that. I think that there are also some things that are cultural touchstones that um, can provoke responses, either positive or negative. And living, you know, broadening our experiences or, or bringing in a pool of, um, uh, broadening our experiences of those who touch the game in, it, in its, you know, in its early stages can benefit that. But it is, it's getting players to attach to your game, getting players to remember your game years later and have feelings about the things that happened in the game or the things that they built in the game. You know, that's the type of stuff that every designer would love. And if every designer could do it well, then it wouldn't be sort of one of the holy grails of game design. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, it's really important to look at the different facets of empathy too, that it's as much about, you know, reading and interpreting uh, as it is about feeling. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's really important to give the player enough space to form their own opinion and to, to sort of evaluate that themselves. I mean, just looking at, at you know, Brenda's example of the, 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 the nuke in, in civilization that really kind of, you know, stuck with her. If the game had said, oh my God, you just nuked somebody, you know, it would have been a lot less impactful than giving her the space to, to sort of come to that realization herself. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's a really important part of it, you know, as well is, is that you can have whatever vision and goal you want, but you have to leave enough room for the players to, to sort of find their own meaning and things and, and to, you know, have their own experience within the framework that you're designing. Yeah. And I would add that sometimes and most times less, less is more when, when Brenda put out the, that example on civilization, uh, the game Defcon came to mind. It's a super minimalist game. And if you put your mind to it, you it's quite fearful what you are doing in that game. And, and I use that in classroom and, and, and it's, it's been powerful, the emotions that it can elicit with such little in terms of imagery and, and, and narrative. And at the same time, as, as Brenda pointed out, it's super difficult to achieve that. And the fears that need to be empathetic with oneself are, uh, are the designers, because most times, as, as we've seen in the previous panel, most times we are going to fail, uh, fail strepitously. So uh, the, the, the final goal of empathy is compassion, and we should be self-compassionate with, with what we are trying to achieve.
it's the only way that at some point we would achieve that. Amazing. Such Everyone has such great words of wisdom. So I think that's a great place to end it. Um, Brenda Romero, Hector Fuster, Ken Hall, thank you so, so much for taking this time to talk about this very complicated uh, uh, topic. Um, I know we just scratched the surface of it, but, um, but this is such a, a great discussion. Um, it's a privilege to be able to chat with you and um, thank you so much once again.